Good morning. Today we are in Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus has, we had the birth of Jesus, the genealogy, the, the prequel sort of, and then Jesus went and got baptized by John the Baptist, and it says immediately after, immediately after, other, other gospels also explain, it was right after his baptism, all this other stuff started happening, and uh, Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And all over in the scriptures, whenever the wilderness comes up, something's going to change. Something's going to transition. Um, something's going to grow. People might grow and mature into something new. The um, Hagar ran off, you know, left Abraham and took Ishmael. And that's where God heard her and saw her and made a promise to Ishmael that, that he would be taken care of and he would be all right. Jacob was in the wilderness when he saw angels going up and down to heaven uh, on a staircase or a ladder. And he knew this was the place of God. This was the house of God. That was in the wilderness. In that same spot, when Jacob came back, <clears throat> in that wilderness experience, Jacob wrestled with God all night and was blessed by him and became Israel. His name was changed to Israel. Of course, the 40 years in the wilderness of Exodus and Numbers with uh, the, whole, the whole nation of Israel, uh, the, all the Hebrews slaves leaving Egypt and going to the promised land, all of that change in the wilderness, right? And then even King David changing from a boy that was a shepherd in the king's court and serving the king to becoming king himself with his little band of desperados and felons that were in debt and all that stuff. That happened in the wilderness. So Jesus going into the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, is a big deal. That means, here we go, the, the trans. Transition from carpenter, young man, into Messiah, rabbi, teacher is about to happen. And it also says Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And sometimes you might read that and be like, well, why would the Spirit lead him to be tempted? And the temptation here is not a testing to make him fail it's um it's a it's a testing to show that it's done it is the the toothpick being stuck into the brownies you know if i said when the brownies were completed we stuck the toothpick into the brownies to see if they were brownies we know they're brownies. We just don't know if they're edible brownies. We don't know. We need to show to ourselves that they're edible. And um, the same way like a, a blacksmith is, is heating up metal and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, there's a testing and a trueness of hardness that they're testing when they hit it. And that is a testing. So it's not tempting it, hoping it will fail. It's making sure it works sort of kind of thing. Showing, showing its integrity. That's, that's a really good one. Um, he was led into the whole, led by the spirit into the wilderness so that his integrity could be shown by the devil's temptations. How do you like that? He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And he says he was hungry. This is the wild part. The devil knew the depth of Jesus's strength and his closeness to the Father. And so the, the devil pulled out the big guns. The devil tempted him with, with everything he had. And so he didn't tempt him during that 40 days. He waited till the end of the 40 days. Uh, fun thing. So here we are in quarantine, right? And... Quarantine, the word quarantine means 40 days. And so we are in a quarantine and it gets that word, that name comes from Jesus's 40 days in the wilderness. And uh, boy, if that isn't just an exciting encouragement to make this time holy and to make this time worthwhile, 
I don't know what is. I mean, here we are. We're all getting, we're all getting shown. We're all getting uh, tested uh, to show what we are, right? Through all this madness. So the devil comes and he tempts him. And he tempts him with the three most basic temptations that all of mankind would ever have. And they all root back to the same one. And that was the, the very essential base temptation that Adam and Eve failed at. And that was, are you going to do things God's way or are you going to do it your own way? In all of these, God gives us the absolute freedom to do things our own way. He made us in his own image. And part of that is a freedom to make choices and decisions. We're not robots. And so he gives this choice and this choice manifests itself all the time in one, one basic temptation, which is, are you going to obey God and submit to him or are you going to do things your own way? Are you going to eat from the tree of life, which is what God said to do, or eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where you kind of think and you reason, and this is good, and this is bad, and I'm going to try to choose the good one. You're still eating from the wrong tree. You're still not even supposed to eat from that tree. You're supposed to go to God. Go to him. He is life. And so the devil waits 40 days, so Jesus will be at his weakest. And then he tempts him. Temptation number one is uh, food, provision. Will you be taken care of? The tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus is hungry, right? But he answered, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we read this, and it seems kind of simple. I mean, bread, what's the big deal, right? Well, remember, he hasn't eaten for 40 days. He is being miraculously maintained. He hasn't starved to death or anything and uh he's really hungry now remember this is wilderness this is not just open uh, sahara desert kind of thing of nothing but sand everywhere this is there's shrubs there's rocks there's cliffs um, there's streams there it's it's wilderness but it's still risky i mean there's animals out there uh, the whole bit but he hasn't eaten and so his, it is a genuine temptation to use his God power as the son of God to just miracle himself some food. And he could do it out of rocks if he wanted to. Um, but he doesn't because he knows more than needing food, he needs God. And that's what the devil is making in opposition here. Would you rather have food and meet your needs for food, which God created you to eat, right? We have to eat. If we don't eat, we starve and we die. Would you rather have that or would you rather have God? And Jesus is saying, I want to do it God's way. I don't want to do it my own way. I don't want to do it by my own strength. I want to trust God to provide this food for me. And I'm going to live off of his word that will satisfy me. Now, I could be tempted after 40 minutes without food, right? You lay that donut in front of me and I'm there. The, the important thing here was that it wasn't about food. It was about your basic needs for living. Are you going to try to accomplish those on your own or are you going to trust God? Because we'll read in the coming chapters, there's a lot of times where day-to-day -day life for Jesus was on the road and it was desperate and it was just living by whatever the Lord provided for him. And if he was depending on his own self to just miracle himself bread all the time, that relationship with God would be severely broken because he wouldn't be depending on God every day for his daily bread, right? Quintessential to how he told us to pray, depend on God for your food. So don't, for us, it's our bills, right? Whether it's medical bills, electric bills, whether it's our savings account, the thing that we put our trust in to rely on, not saying don't be wise, not saying don't work, 
But what are we really trusting in? What are we really putting our hope in? And there's a way to work and have a job and pay bills and entrust all that to God and not do it ourselves and not um, expecting a pat on the back from the Lord for what a great job you did in providing for yourself. Yikes, don't be that guy. Well, that was the devil's temptation. Would you rather provide for yourself or depend on God for something as basic as bread? The second temptation involved safety and security. Matthew chapter four, verse five, the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Notice the devil is now quoting the scriptures to Jesus, which is funny. Jesus said to him, again, it's written, you shall not put the Lord God to the test. So this answers the, the temptation to do nothing, right? I can just do nothing. Even if I fall off a building, God's angels will rescue me. No, 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 no. Don't, don't put God to the test like that. You still do what God's commanding you to do and walk in the fullness of life. And God will lead you in it. But don't test him. Don't do stupid stuff. Um, this is also the temptation to uh, hedonism. And God has to give me what I want. Right? Uh, I, I want God to save me when I jump off of this building. And he has to do it because the Bible says, Wee! And I jump off. This is the same kind of thing that gets taught today and is twisted when preachers say, give your money and God will bless you. That is the exact same. Jump, you know, put your, run yourself into debt and, and give up and give all your money to me so I can buy a jet and God will bless you. That's the exact same as saying jump off a building and God will catch you. It really is. Um, who's the boss here, right? Not me. Not me forcing God to intervene. Not me being foolish and saying, well, God, you got me into this. You got to get me out of it. God didn't get you into that problem. Um, you weren't obeying him as you walked into it. He still might rescue you, but don't think you're going to force his hand on it. The thing is, God gives us freedom to do wrong. God gives us freedom and an ability to rebel against him. And that's why it's a temptation we are, he, he gives us the freedom to sin against him and he is, does not open the earth up and swallow us whole. He doesn't send down lightning bolts. He watches and he's like, well, I'm going to use that to really grow Dan and to really shape him and really teach him. He's going to learn so much from this. And I already, you know, God says, I already, Jesus already died for that sin. It's forgiven. But boy, are you going to learn how to be close to God because of the sin you just committed. That's how all that works. We're also tempted to fear. We're tempted to fear. And, be, you know, what if God doesn't save me? What if God doesn't rescue me from the coronavirus? What if God doesn't rescue me from financial collapse or from the burglars or, um, you know, whatever fear you have? And we're tempted to fear and worry that God won't rescue us. And we can have total trust and confidence in God. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but desires everybody to come to eternal life. He wants us to be saved. He wants our neighbors to be saved. He wants generations to be saved and put their trust in him. And he will allow us to suffer and have hard times and go through rough things if it will bring him glory. Jesus is an example of that, right? How could, if, if God loves Jesus, how could he let him suffer like that? Well, that he was letting Pilate be free. He was letting those Roman guards, he could have unleashed fire on those Roman guards and blown them off the face of the earth as soon as they got out a crown of thorns before they ever put it on him. But um, part of God's plan and part of what Jesus was doing needed that to be allowed while he was going through his crucifixion. So we don't have anything to fear. We don't have anything to fear at all. 
Even, even if we're destroyed, even if we suffer, we have nothing to fear because God is taking care of us and he is close to us and he's walking us through this stuff. The alternative is Noah's Ark and Sodom and Gomorrah, right? If we did the wrong thing, boom, gone. And um, Jesus took all of our wrath. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. And so now everything, God is working everything to the benefit of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But it's God's benefit. It's not my jet and my gold Mercedes. It's, it's God's benefit and God's glory. So Jesus is tempted with food and provision. Jesus is tempted with safety and security. And um, finally, Jesus is tempted with authority. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for you shall, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Him only will you serve. The devil finally overplayed his hand and just said, bow down and serve me. And Jesus knows he's not going to bow down and serve the devil. Um, there's no way. But the devil has control of the world. He, he does. He controls every kingdom. I mean, this, this is kind of mind-boggling to think about. Um, there's numerous places in the scripture where it talks about you were once children of wrath before you became Christians. So what does that mean people that aren't Christians are? They're still in that, in that family, children of wrath. At one point, Jesus calls the Pharisees sons of the devil because they don't believe in him. They're not following him. They're sons of the devil. There's only two families, the sons of God and the sons of the devil. There's another place where Paul talks about um, the devil is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's the ruler of all the kingdoms that are going on right now. And that is really good for us to, to keep in mind, that no matter how much we think um, Christianity can influence culture and the impact we can have, we can have peop impact on people and we can have impact on culture. But the devil rules the nations. He rules every kingdom that's on earth. And, um, and any Christian that is in it, it's awesome. And it's awesome that there's a Christian in those positions of authority and power, but they are in the position of earthly power. And the devil is ruling right now over them as a spiritual power. Isn't that rough? That's super complex. We could talk for hours about that. So the devil who controls all these powers, offers them to Jesus. And he says, bow down to me and I will give you all of this power. Now, the wild thing is that Jesus, as the son of God and equal to God, rules the world. He rules over Satan. But because of his love for us, he has given us the grace and the freedom to rebel against him. That was the freedom that he gave Adam and Eve. And so Adam and Eve gave up that freedom and sold it to sin, sold it to the power of sin so the devil could rule over mankind. And so Jesus has to come into mankind and be present as a person to undo that, to undo that deal that Adam made that the sacrifice is now made and now Jesus is beating death and beating sin and, and bringing back the, his kingdom that rules. And so the devil offers him a way around that. You don't have to get crucified. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through all these prophecies of Isaiah that you're going to get striped, that you're going to get whipped. Uh, you don't have to go through the prophecies of Jeremiah that you're going to get pierced. You can just bow down to Satan. And Jesus didn't do it. He 
said, get away from me. It's wild. This is the first time that Jesus says, be gone, get away. He knows the devil has come with these strong, strong, strong temptations. And it's almost like Jesus knows this is the best you've got. This is your top temptation. And so just get away from me. And so the devil leaves. It actually says in Luke that the devil left until a more opportune time. So the devil was going to wait until he had another chance. He wasn't going to tempt him nonstop. The devil isn't omnipotent that he has power all over everywhere. He's not, not omniscient that he knows everything. Um, so the devil is only tempting him at certain times. That gives me a lot of joy. It gives me a lot of victory over fear, right? I don't have to worry about the devil always tempting me. The devil didn't always tempt Jesus. He just came when there was an opportune time. And of course, there's a side note on that of give the devil as little opportune time as you can, right? If you realize I'm really tempted to sin a lot on, you know, when this happens, when the, when the weather, when the weather's dreary, I get really down and depressed and, and I hate my life. Um, when I watch the news, I go to bed with a whole lot of fear. Well, quit watching the news and you'll have victory over your fear. You'll, you'll see that it'll happen. Um, there's all kinds of ways that, that we actually have control of what is an opportune time for the devil and we can avoid those times, right? So then Jesus comes. He goes, he comes out of the wilderness. The angels minister to him, it says, which uh, they could have brought him food. They could have led him to a place to have food. But that's an obvious way that God has provided for him, that God has, has given him what he needed at the right time. God didn't let him die. And so here's an instance of he didn't let his feet hit the ground like, you know, the angels are going to rescue him. The angels probably gave him food. If they gave Elijah food with ravens, God can give Jesus food with angels. And then as far as authority goes, how awesome would it be if you were hungry and God sent angels to serve you? How's that for authority? It says later in Hebrews that angels are sent as serving spirits to mankind. They, they're sent to serve us. Wow. Wow. So skip down to Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is happening right now. God's kingdom is entering. A man has stood up to the devil. A man has resisted the temptation of the devil. And so this kingdom of the devil that's been in effect ever since Adam gave in to sin, is now being undone. It is now being unraveled. And the kingdom of heaven, where we obey God and we live for God and we make God God and not some idol like our food or our safety or our authority, we don't have those idols. We just worship God purely in spirit and in truth, like Jesus would say later. Repent means, it's a, it's a, the Greek word is metanoia, and it's to turn around and to go a different way. It's to think differently. So think differently about sin, that you're not going to be condemned for it anymore because Jesus is going to pay for it. Think differently about temptation, that I have to give in to this. I have to do this myself. I have to do it my own way. No, God's going to do it for you. He's going to be here for you. And then he calls his disciples. And this is a really exciting, fun thing. And uh, just the way Jesus called these guys and who they were. Matthew 4, 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who would be called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. You get more details about that event in some of the other gospels about how they caught all these fish and, and they got to hear some of Jesus's teaching. But the point is they followed him. They went after him and they learned from him. Um, 
there was a, a little code word in there, in their culture that we don't get because we don't have it in our culture. But when a rabbi teacher was recruiting disciples, when he was recruiting students, he would go to them and say, follow me. And that would mean you just got accepted into Yale. You just, the, the college called, you didn't have to apply to the college. The college called you and they said, join us. And so when Jesus walks up, these guys are fishermen. This means they flunked out of rabbi school. Um, if you couldn't, if you couldn't, being a rabbi was the best job in the world. And if you couldn't do that, you just go do whatever your dad did and you continue the family business. And so these guys couldn't cut it in rabbi school. But now, out of nowhere, after years of fishing, a rabbi comes up and says, join rabbi school. I'll be your teacher. Come on. Yes! They would totally go do that, right? Immediately, they left their nets. They go on. From there, they get James, the son of De Zebedee, and John, his brother. And in the boat, they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father. And they were fixing their nets and Jesus calls them immediately. They left their boats and their father and they went and followed them. And he went all through Galilee. This is like a whole region at the north of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, we would call it lake, a, a big lake, but still. And uh, so they're all over this area. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So Jesus is going to the synagogues because there's people there studying the prophets that have foretold. There are people that are sincere that want to draw near to God. And Jesus is proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And if you doubted it, I'll heal this person, I'll heal this person, I'll heal this person. He's healing every disease and every affliction. His fame spreads all through Syria. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus is healing people. Um, I, don't, I don't have any stories from recent. My, my most recent stories would probably be about a year old, but Jesus still heals people today. We can still call on his name and ask him and he he takes away illness he rebuilds things and i don't have a good explanation of why sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't i don't i don't understand that but i also don't want to rule over it and i don't want i don't want to make myself an authority over him i want to i want to submit to him and lean on him and depend on him but at the same time we can still ask for healing. We can still ask for people to be delivered. Um, if, if anybody would have, would have talked about me the day before I got saved, they would have never expected that I would have gotten saved the night that I got saved and what kind of person I would be like the next day. Um, it, it was completely unexpected and it was completely different. It was a completely different change of, of person that I was. And so that gives me a lot of faith to pray for other people, to pray for hopeless cases, to pray for people that I'm just like, man, they are so messed up. They are layers of messed up. And Jesus can fix all that overnight. He really can. And so Jesus healed all these people and his fame spread all over and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. That was another section right next to Galilee. And from Jerusalem and Judea, that's way down south. That's like three days journey down south. And from beyond the Jordan, that would be into Gentile lands. People all over were hearing about Jesus and coming to follow him and to draw near to him and to seek him. And uh, you can see why. I mean, look at, look at what's happening. Jesus resisted the temptation to put himself in crisis just so God would rescue him. And now he is doing God's will, which is to preach the kingdom of heaven. And that's going to put him in danger. And he's going to trust God to rescue him, which ultimately God will raise him from the dead. He won't rescue him from death. He'll rescue him from death after it happens, after he's dead. He is, uh, you know, tempted 
to seek after food and his provisions and what he needs. Oh, Jesus, I need this. Give it to me, right? I'll, I'll just make it myself. And instead, he depends on God. And look at how God gives him everything he needs. God gives him disciples, and the disciples have boats. So whenever they need to cross the river or the Sea of Galilee, they've got boats because his disciples had boats. And that, I mean... Matthew, he calls Matthew. Matthew's got all this money, so that pays for a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, just the way God provides food and security and then authority. He did not bow down to the devil. He resisted the devil. And yet now he commands demons and he has authority to kick demons out of people. Wow. Because because who gave him that authority? God, not the devil. And so we can learn from all of this that to, there are ways that we give in to temptation that we don't even know that the devil is tempting us to, to resist God. That maybe culturally, just our whole culture does it. And so we do it without even thinking about it. Let's, let's search those things out. Let's seek after Jesus. Let's rely on God and depend on God as we follow him and we will see him deliver and help and he will great crowds followed him we don't want great crowds following us we want great crowds following jesus and there's plenty of people watching us follow jesus to learn how to imitate us right all right that's matthew chapter four god bless you